Please give an extremely warm welcome to Lord David Owen. Well, thank you very much uh, for asking me, and it's a great pleasure to come. The official title for what I'm going to say is an amicable divorce from the European Union. I think that uh, it needs to be said right at the start that after this election, I hope we will be able to see the country come together a lot more than we've seen so far. My main message to you and everyone is that Brexit is not the preserve of any one political party. Indeed, it's not the preserve of the political parties. Once you make a decision to have a referendum, you change the whole nature of normal British politics. That's what happened in 1975, and that is what has happened in 2016. Basically, we only have referendums when the political structures themselves break down, when they are divided amongst themselves. That was the situation for Labour in 1975, and that was the situation for the Conservative Party in 2016. But now, the issue which we have to face and look at is how do we take the negotiations of Britain and the government of the day with 27 other EU countries. It's a very complex and difficult negotiation. And what I want to try to explain today is to dispel some myths and also I hope to bring some clarity and the facts about what is called the European Economic Area Agreement the EEAA. In my view, two years ago, I think, I would say, I thought you could do this uh, exit from the European Union quickly. I still think if the will had been there, it would have been possible to get a <coughs> treaty, an EU-UK treaty, very quickly by using a lot of the language within the existing treaties within which we and the other 27 countries have lived since Britain went in in 73. But that was not to be, and I think it was very wise of the Prime Minister to start to talk in recent months about an implementation period after we had left the European Union. And uh, I think that it is a simple reality <coughs> We will not get an EU-UK trade agreement much under four to five years. So you take two years between now and March 2019 when, in my view, it is clear we will leave the European Union. During those negotiations, there must be a dialogue on trade agreement, but also there will be a lot of the minutiae of the actual exit process. Now, what I think is fundamental is to look at the EEA as a transitional mechanism. But the advantage of talking about implementation period is that implementation, you have to have something to implement. So you won't get an agreement in those first two years before we leave, but hopefully you'll get the outline of a trade agreement, if you like, a heads of agreement. And I think that's what we should aim for. Now, what this existing European Economic Area Agreement presents is a transitional mechanism. It's a framework, and it allows us to leave when we want. Having left the EU after two years, you can do so without a cliff edge, which is inherent in the whole design of Article 50. There need be no cliff edge because you move from being a member of the European Union to being a contracting party under the EEA agreement. Now, 
at the moment, you could negotiate in good faith. You could actually streak an agreement with the other 27 governments. And you would then go to ratification, and right near the end, you could suddenly find a failure to ratify, either in the European Parliament or in the individual 27 countries. And then you would come to the deadline date, and that is the cliff edge that was deliberately designed into it. Because the designers didn't want it ever to be used. And they're quite overt about it. Lord Kerr in this country, a very senior diplomat, and the former Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister of Italy, D'Amato. And they have been quite overt in saying this is what Article 50 represented. Well, David Cameron took the country across this threshold and promised that if he uh, lost his and didn't get his way in the referendum, he would stay on as Prime Minister and immediately sign up for Article 50. Well, for reasons which most of us understand, first, he didn't stay as Prime Minister. And secondly, when they looked at the cupboard of how much work and evaluation had been done about what was going to be needed in the negotiations, there'd been no economic assessment, there'd been no uh, preparatory work, because they were so confident that they would win. So it was inevitable that we went for a period of uh, nine months, putting in place the structures for an Article 50 negotiation and for looking at the questions of trade agreement. Now, it was not, in my view, foolish for the government to say that faced by a bad offer from the EU, which under Article 50 we are not allowed to change, that we would be prepared to leave even so. I know it's often attacked and it's called a hard Brexit, but certainly even as a negotiating position, you have to say that this is possible. And I think it must be. But surely we are capable of devising a mechanism where that is not necessary. And fortunately, a mechanism exists. So I believe it would be irresponsible too to start, to not to start going out and explaining to the, company, to the country what being a member of the EEA is. You're either a contracting party to the European agreement as an EU member, or you can be a contracting party as a non-EU member, and they are completely different. And in the debate that is going on among sophisticated audiences in this country, there has not been a sufficient attention to the difference. The EEA agreement is binding upon the contracting parties, one of which is the UK. It's a multilateral international treaty. It is not a bilateral agreement between the EU and EFTA, as it is sometimes supposed and frequently described. If necessary, it would be possible for us to exercise our right to use the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and dispute the procedure which is held by many that if you leave the EU, you automatically leave the EEA. That, in my judgment, is not the case, and it is an incorrect reading of the law, and certainly it is in the spirit of the law, that a country that left the EU could continue as a contracting party with only a few very minor changes. Now, decision-making autonomy in respect of treaties is, of course, constrained within the EEA for EU, EU treaties. But only if you're in the EU. If you're no longer in the EU and you're a non-EU member, you're constrained by the agreement as it affects those members, and they are very different, and I will try to explain why. When we leave in March 2019, we, we must retain this treaty-making powers which are given to us as a non-EU member and have not anything to do with the European Court of Justice. There is a separate court which affects 
non-EU members, an EFTA court. And this is a major difference between the entailments of an EU treaty and the entailments of an European Economic Area Agreement. Now, as members of the EEA, during this implementation period, we would intend to conclude a trade agreement, and I believe it would be very necessary to make clear to everybody that we are only going to stay at that for a limited period, and I think a reasonable to say for three years at the most, so we would be able to come out of the whole arrangement and be freestanding by the time of the next general election. So by March 2022, we would be out of the EEA. And in order to go out of the EEA, it is a very simple procedure. You just give a year's notice. So we're talking about having to give notice in March 2021. That's after four years of two years of inside uh, Article 50 procedures and two years as a continuing contracting party to the European Economic Area. Now, Norway makes voluntary payments to the European Economic Area, and they do it for a variety of reasons and a number of subjects, and that is their right to do it. And this provides, I think, an extremely important precedent for the UK when asked to make payments to the other 27 members of the European Union. We could, for example, say that if we were three years in the EEA, we would be ready to pay perhaps as much as our net payment to the EU budget uh, over three years, over £30 billion. Now, I think that is a, a more reasonable sum and certainly a much more acceptable mechanism than the one that is being demanded from us from the EU at the moment which is an exit payment, which has no precedent, no legal uh, explanation, and I think is quite unacceptable. So you'll gather that I'm trying to all the time find ways of handling this process within existing law, within precedent, which is the way of dealing with the EU, which is a very precedent-driven organisation. It's quite flexible as long as there's a precedent. It's remarkably inflexible where there is no precedent. So I think the EEA offers an existing pathway for the UK and the EU to move almost seamlessly through an early exit from the EU, where that's obligatory anyhow, it's two years, and to complete in a four to five year process. Now, in the EEA agreement text relating to contracting parties, they're divided into two sublists. The um, first sublist comprises well, they use, of course, the term e European Community because that was when the EA was introduced, but effectively the EU. And the second sublist now comprises Iceland, uh, Norway, and Liechtenstein. But it originally also contained Austria, Finland, and Sweden, who left the EA to join the EU and became EU members of the European Economic Area with different obligations and different rules. They, therefore, these three countries, when they move from the uh, second to the first sublist, um, changed not being contracting parties but in obligations. And in each case, it is the country's own government in the non EU states and their parliaments that is responsible for the obligations under the treaty. Again, that is not explained sufficiently. They have their own courts. They have their own parliamentary procedures, and it was designed with a different objective. The EEA agreement starts with objectives and principles, and the primary objective I will read to you. The aim of this agreement of association is to promote a continuous and balanced strengthening of trade and economic relations between the contracting parties with equal conditions of competition and the respect of the same rules with a view to creating a homogeneous European economic area here and after referred to as the EEA. I often and others often call it a wider Europe. So this is not a mechanism or a vehicle which is outside Europe. It is designed to create 
a Europe which goes beyond the EU. And in my view, it could be a mechanism and should be a mechanism that is used for some of the countries who would hope to come into the EU earlier but are blocked, and many of those are in the Balkans. Now, the agreement aims, unlike the aims of the treaties, are unambiguously economic in nature. It goes beyond free trade agreements in two respects. First, the scope and, uh, of coverage is broader, and it talks about equal conditions of competition. And second, the provisions go deeper by respect of the same rules. So you've got a diverse, in the sense of two entities, coming together, but under the same rules, but living within different rules into how they manage their affairs. On the one side, you come under the Commission and under the European Union and the treaties, you have common citizenship. On the other side, you don't have common citizenship. You don't come under the Commission, you don't come under the European Court of Justice. So, in order to attain the objectives of the agreement, which are set out in paragraph one, I'll read this too. The association shall entail in accordance with the provisions of this agreement, A, the free movement of goods, B, the free movement of persons, C, the free movement of services, and D, the free movement of capital, which are familiar to us as the four uh, founding principles of the Treaty of Rome. It goes on to have also the setting up of a system ensuring that competition is not distorted and that the rules are equally respected and closer cooperation in other fields such as research and development, the environment, education and social policy. Now, when you come to those uh, founding principles, the one that is very controversial, as we all know, is free movement of persons, and this is contentious. When first introduced, it was felt by many in the Treaty of Rome and in the debates that went on in the late 50s and 60s and early 70s in this country to be very much a um, aspiration. And that's how I certainly looked at it, just to divert a little. In 1962, I was uh, a Labour candidate for a constituency, Torrington and North Devon, where the only issue was whether or not I could save my deposit. But the then leader of the Labour Party when faced by Harold Macmillan's wish to, and decision to apply to join what was called then the common market, warned this country. And he made a very major and emotive speech, which I identified with completely and I have never changed my mind. He said, in principle, the concept of European unity is a very good one. But remember that the founding fathers wanted it to be a United States of Europe. And he said that having talked in detail to Monet and to Spark, two of the basic founding principles. He was a serious figure, Hugh Gateskill, and he said, if you want to be a Florida or a California in a United States of Europe, fair enough. But effectively, what he said, sail under your true colors. Now, I think many of us thought in 71 that it would be possible to be a member of this organization without it becoming a United States of Europe, and that these issues which were aspirational would remain so, that changed with the Maastricht Treaty. And I think that it would have been a lot easier if when Maastricht came into being, it was accepted that the free movement of persons, and particularly the free movement of workers, was necessary for a single currency to work, but it was not necessary for those countries in the European Union who were not part of the single currency. However, that was not done, and a variety of different attempts to negotiate a different structure was not made. Now, later on in objectives and principles in the agreement moves to obligations. And this is an important distinction. In the obligations, we have a phrase, in order to attain. And it's there that they imply the four freedoms are considered as objectives, subordinate or secondary to the primary aim set out in Article 1, which is commercial and economic. And if that is ambiguous, then resolution of ambiguities, ambiguities in the agreement would have to go to an international treaty. Uh, and I think this is where we come into 
the strength of this, if you like, evolutionary approach which I'm adopting, if the interpretation is held to by the European Union that if you leave the EU, you leave the automatically the EEA, the way to deal with this is to go to international law and to invoke the Vienna Convention. Article 31, 1 of which states, a treaty shall be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in their context and in the light of its object and purpose. It's very important to stress that the agreement is a document directed towards not only a very clear commercial policy object or purpose, but the interpretation of the agreement's implications and entailments should necessarily give a high weight to that fact, consistent with the principles enunciated within the Vienna Conventions. Now, I hope and believe that if we indicate that this is how we see the implementation period, continuing on as a contributing member, there will be no objection from the European Union to us doing so, and we will agree in the um, process of Article 50 to making the changes in the treaty, minor changes in the treaty, similar in reverse, which were made when Austria, Austria and Finland left, and Sweden left being non-EU members and became EU members, and all we're asking to do is to do it in reverse. But if they are not ready to do this, then I do believe we should go to international law. And I believe in that international legal process, the ordinary meaning of terms, which is a uh, Vienna Convention language, uh, really in the Treaty of, of Successions, would find in our favor. Because they would say, you are trying to keep within the spirit of the EEA, and you are being prevented from doing so. And I think that when they referred to balanced strengthening of trade and economic cooperation too, we would be able to demonstrate that we were arguing for continuity of the purposes of the European economic area. Now, the text of the agreement indicates that its drafters and its signatories were fully aware of all these issues. The agreement explicitly recognizes that obligations are to at least some extent contingent on circumstances. When it comes to giving greater specificity to the obligations of the contracting parties, the agreement consistently allows limits to be placed on free movement, providing these limits are justified. And on Vienna Convention principles, any proposed limitation on free movement can be said to be justified if it positively contributes to the overall purposes. So the EEA seeks a lesser degree of freedom of movement than do the EU treaties. Or put the other way around, it is less constraining on the ability of national governments to intervene. And I think that this can be most easily seen by observing that the agreement does not establish a customs union. It therefore allows for the existence of customs controls at borders between the EU contracting party Sweden and the non-EU contracting party Norway. And these controls signify acceptance of greater limitations on the free movement of goods than is allowed by the EU treaties themselves. So what I'm trying to build a case is that this agreement is more flexible, designed far better for our purposes than uh, coming out of the EU. Now I have to be quite open and frank with you. There are people who have argued that this is where we should go and this is where we should stay. I do not share that view. I think that an interpretation of the referendum is that we do wish to return to a situation which we had up until 73, in which we control our own borders. That was said quite openly in the referendum by the uh, Leave campaign to be the reason why we could not join the single market. A judgment was made in the light of the Cameron negotiations that the EU, in my view for understandable reasons, were not prepared to change the founding principles 
and they were not to make compromises on this issue. And I think we have to recognize, therefore, that this loose talk of joining the single market and having it is very different from access to the single market, and even getting access to the single market has problems for EU negotiators. So we need to look at how we develop our relationship. And I think it would be better and fairer to be quite open about the fact that we are not staying in permanent present. We are staying and using it for a transition period, for the implementation period, to avoid a cliff edge, for avoiding damage which will damage our economy but also the European Union economy. And looking forward over the next three years, next five years, it's very difficult to be sure what's going to happen to the world economy. Very difficult. We didn't anticipate what happened in 2008 and 2009. The signs were there, but we didn't read them correctly. And there are already signs out over the world economy that are troubling. I think there's a reasonable chance of getting through this. But nevertheless, a wise Europe and a wise UK would try to provide for a stable next five years as is humanly possible, given we all have different positions. Crucially for non-EU states, the agreement puts most of the controversial matters not, of course, in the Commission or even with the European Council of Ministers. It is put within the hands of national governments and national parliaments. And that was quite deliberate. That was the choice of the then non-EU members, and many of them <coughs> Scandinavian, with a very strong commitment, as we have in this country, <coughs> to parliamentary control and the feeling that laws should be made in our own parliament and carried out by our own government. Now, where Liechtenstein, a very small country, has been extremely interesting is right from the start. They have had an immigration policy within the EEA, and not just an emergency one, but one that has been with them throughout this period that they've been members. So I think it is perfectly reasonable and possible that we could find ourselves within the EEA for that three-year period to make, start making adjustments on immigration. And it's a period anyhow which we know we have to move cautiously. After we come out, and why I believe we should come out of the EEA, then I would feel it was possible for a government with training programs and with very highly sensitive policies for immigration which do allow people with special skills to come in. And that immigration policy, I think, should be the same for EU nationals as for the rest of the world then I think it is possible to start to deliver what there is no doubt a large number of people want in this country, which is more uh, tougher controls on immigration. So uh, as, uh, as throughout this whole process, I think it's an evolutionary one. Now, when the EEA was established, the UK did not join as part of an EU decision. This is important. Each EU member state made its own singular application a demonstration that membership was made as an individual state. And further confirmation of that is that um, when Croatia acceded to the EU, it, they did so significantly in advance of becoming a member of the EEA. So the EEA agreement, as I've said, does not establish a customs union, but it does not stop any, any EU state independently determining its own commercial policies in relation to states that are not contracting parties and can also, if it so wishes, unilaterally choose to negotiate membership of the EU Customs Union. So that issue is again left open for negotiations. Now, as many of you know, perhaps the one thing that most people do know about the EEA is that it has exclusions of food products and does not entail participation in the common agricultural or in the common fishing policy. And of course, that was very attractive particularly to Norway, and one of the reasons why the Norwegians lost their referendum. I may say in passing, I was asked by the then Prime Minister of uh, Norway because he was on Labour, and he wanted a young Labour MP to go into that referendum. It was one of the major mistakes in my life. I spoke on a platform with Willy Brandt, 
and we were howled down by the citizens from the moment we started to speak. I kept on explaining that I'd only come to tell them about what was happening in uh, England and somebody said, well, why don't you do it from there, not from here? <laughs> so it's a problem, these uh, interventions in uh, debates, as, of course, President Obama found. Uh, the only time there was a step-like increase in the vote to leave was during the four days of President Obama's visit, where we can argue as to whether it was 3 or 5%. So uh, be wary about interfering in other people's states and other people's decisions. The general public don't like it. Now, the point I think I would also make is there is a qualification in these entailments in this agreement, which is that when you come to the issue of free movement of workers, they say these entailments are then immediately limited by disapplying them to employment in public service. Well, public service is a very general term. So I do again think that even in a three-year period, we would be allowed, we'd have to talk to the Norwegians and we'd have to talk to the Icelanders and uh, gain experience from Liechtenstein that we might find we were able to start on this process. But I think I would recommend it, even if you found insuperable op uh, obstacles to it. But I think it gives you an idea that we are not talking about a continuation through another vehicle of EU membership. We're out of the EU. We're out of practically all those things which many people find difficulty in accepting. And we're in a different framework and I think it should be only one which we operate for a fairly short period of time. Now, there are many other aspects of all this, and I don't want to go into it in a great deal of detail, except I've mentioned this Norway voluntary contribution. I think this is important, and I think that we have to try to find our way out from a situation which I don't like one little bit. Firstly, the they were coming in with something like uh, 70 billion. And then three countries, Germany, France, and Poland, upped the ante with another extra 20 plus a billion, right in the last moment. Of course, we have nothing to do with their negotiating position. They formulate that negotiating position. I think that was deeply provocative. And for the first time, it made me wonder whether it might be not possible to reach agreement. And there are people who believe that uh, we may find that the European unity's dysfunctional nature at the moment makes it extremely difficult for them to come up with anything other than an unrealistic package because they have to uh, compensate all of the different number one priorities of 27 countries. And remember, it isn't a negotiation. In the end of the day, they put down their final offer and you either say yes or no. So um, I think this business of being able to remain a contracting member and our readiness to use the international law of the Vienna Convention is very important. Now, what's the other side? I mean, surely you would be asking, David Owen's only giving us one side of the picture. I mean, why do the EU uh, say that going out uh, of the EU automatically means leaving the EEA. Well, what they do is quote Article 26, some of them, which addresses issues raised by special member state territories, like for us in the UK, the Isle of Man and Channel Islands. And the first short paragraph of Article 126 refers simply to the agreement applying to territories which the EC, now read EU, treaty applies and under the conditions applied in those treaties. And it's those wording some lawyers, taking the text out of contact, have interpreted this to mean that Article 126 is determinative of contracting party status. But that was obviously not the intention. And there is a little islands, the Aland Islands, which lie in the Baltic Sea. And 80% of one Article 126 is about the Aland Islands. Now, if you are really making a definitive judgment about what would affect the UK contracting party status, 
Frankly, you don't do it in one, two, six. And in my view, this is a rather foolish way of arguing the case. But that is the main substantive way that it has been argued at the moment. So a narrow interpretation would, in effect, seek to exploit a potential ambiguity like this to create a backdoor means of withdrawal from the EEA, and that would not be very desirable either. So I think we should set aside 126, use common sense, remember what has been done in the past, and reach agreement right from day one that we, Britain will go in an implementation period using this agreement and will not be intending to stay and we expect to be out before the next general election. And whatever views you have about the general election, either one way or the other, there is going to be a new government with a five-year period to negotiate and settle this question. Impatience is understandable. People who want to get out want to get out straight away. But carrying people with you is quite important too, but there are practical arguments why a cliff edge is dangerous. Trade is not just about a trade agreement. There are a whole raft of arrangements, MRAs and others, which America undertakes to uh, agree first with the EU when they trade under WTA rules as well. I was in business for the last uh, 20 plus years, trading steel and iron ore across the world in a lot in Europe. And the paperwork and the things that have to go to ensure that the uh, lorry goes through all the different uh, countries and is able to deliver its goods on time and to date are important aspects. You may be able to handle it and rough it over, but if you can reach uh, arrangements in which the minimum of disruption to trade and the maximum of agreement and understanding, then we should go to it. Now, David Davis, the Secretary of State, has uh, put forward the situation post-Brexit. We've left the EU, and the, he says then the uh, law would remain uh, over contracting party status would be an empty vessel because the EEA would no longer apply to UK territories if the Commission view was held, but we would not be in uh, as a contracting party. So we need to look at all these issues and we need to look at the circumstances caused by Brexit calls for a simple textual amendment to reflect that the UK is no longer an EU contracting party, but has become instead an NEU contracting party. I don't think the EU will like us going to international law. The European Court of Justice, which is a regional legal system, has been trying to pretend that they are an international legal system, but that is not the case. And they would not uh, carry the same status in terms of rulings as the Vienna Court. And I think they also, we need to tell them right from the start, after the election, when we go back with our own position, that we would notify them and the non-EU partners, Iceland, uh, Norway and Liechtenstein, that we would be content to be bound by the law on succession of states, which was passed in 1978. Now, therefore, there's a choice for the government. The choice is, except that under Article 127, we have to give one year's notice in March 2018 of an intention to withdraw from the EEA, and we do it and leave the EU in March 2019, and we're at the cliff edge and we have got nowhere that we understand for the implementation period. Or we continue as a contracting party, we do not give notice, and we have not given notice yet. We've given notice under Article 50, but we've not given notice of an intention to leave the EEA. We don't do so. We ask for minor drafting amendments. We ask that this issue should be cleared up as soon as possible, and that we are able to sense and give to the world that this process will be split into two, out in two years from the EU, out in four to five years, an extra three years, say, um, for, um, from the EEA, and then negotiating. Now, at all times during our membership of the EEA, we can make uh, trade agreements. We're totally free to make trade agreements with whoever we like. 
and uh, we could do it obviously with the EU but we also do need to do it with Norway and Iceland and Liechtenstein and we ought to be looking at the United States and if they are changing the NAFTA arrangement into a, a sort of second tier and more advanced NAFTA agreement try and see if we can come into that arrangement with Canada and the United States and with Mexico probably not being a major part or may not even be a partner on that particular aspect of the negotiations and then there are a lot of other countries where we could go ahead and we would be leaving with already quite a number of international trade agreements which would make life a great deal easier for us. So that's the choice for us. I'm sorry to have explained it at such length. But uh, as anybody who has ever gone through a divorce, unfortunately I haven't, but I sit, watch my friends go through it, the lawyers have a field day. And what you, be you basically need is first goodwill and then good lawyers who are trying to find solutions and not present problems. It is a divorce in many ways. And this I would say to people like me. I have been a lifelong European. I voted with the 69 Labour MPs to go in in 1971. But I campaigned vigorously to stop us signing up for the single currency. And when the single currency started to go wrong in uh, 1999, I led a group called New Europe, which said yes to Europe, but no to the uh, Euro. It is perfectly clear now that President Macron will make a serious attempt to get the degree of integration that most of us have thought is vital for a Eurozone to work effectively. That means going much closer to a United States of Europe. That may take time, but you know, I think it will clarify our relationships if instead of Britain constantly trying to slow down this process, and in fairness we have said under successive governments that we give the highest priority to reforming the Eurozone. So Macron, when you watch his campaign, I mean the ode to joy was alongside the Marseillaise and the uh, European flag was alongside the tricolor. Good luck to him. I have never been uh, critical of my friends who were Federalists. One of my strongest friends over many years was um, Michel Rocard, the former Prime Minister of France under Mitterrand, who was a lifelong Federalist. And uh, during the campaign, I went to Paris and spoke on all things on the platform of the European movement. And I, uh, my one condition was that Michel Rocard should speak to, with me. And we both argued the case of why England should leave the European Union. And in one of it was the essential need to change the Eurozone and that France and Germany are the two countries that have got to put their act together if it's going to be possible to be done. And I think that we will find that a more balanced relationship, being part of the threesome, not easy in many, many respects, and I think we constantly found that we were blocking things because it didn't fit us, but a more integrated Europe does fit reform of the Eurozone and might be acceptable to Germany as long as they see financial disciplines coming with Macron's government. The French have got a long way to go in the next two years to demonstrate to the Germans that they are taking a serious grip on their own finances but it is conceivable and it's surely possible for us to credibly say good luck and we wish you well and we don't want to do anything to harm that process. And how much easier it would be for that process to go on if there is a measure of understanding and good neighborliness. Now there's Article 50 with which we are saddled, but there's also Article 8 which does talk about good neighborliness. It's an obligation in the existing treaty. When we look at the problems of Europe, what's happening in Ukraine still, a totally unresolved problem a regional war that's taken 10,000 lives and could well have engulfed us in a major European war. And when we look at all what's happening with uh, now a growing number of migrants coming from Libya, so it's not just the ones coming into Greece from uh, Syria through Turkey, we are facing enough problems without having really vituperative attacks and venomous conversations 
within people who are basically friends. So I look on this as a, an amicable divorce that is essential and to remember that we are grown-ups and that there are procedures out there which we can use to mutual advantage. And when we come to the final treaty on trade, remember that's a completely different thing. That is a mutually advantageous deal and you do it and you do it all around the world and it ought not to take as long as it looks as if it's going to be taken. But it must be done in five years. And I come back to the situation about if we are going to pay during that period, I would retain quite a substantial portion of that money and it would be paid over when the EU-UK trade, trade agreement had been fixed.